Indian Christian Day Yeshu Bhakti Divas Love, Serve and Celebrate Well, it's 8 o'clock, so we are going to begin today's session. Uh, this is the Indian Christian Day, a God's movement to bring the Christian leaders across the nation and around the world to talk about Indian Christian Day. And um, I'm glad on this day, um, I, I am joining you from uh, Dera Dun um, and John Samuel. I um, served as the Chief Postmaster General in, in the Government of India. Um, that's where probably I met a, quite a lot of people across India, where the Lord helped me to connect with different people. And that's a time where um, probably I, mean, I, I felt that one of the calling is to uh, build the nation. Um, how as God's called children, we can build the nation. Um, in different areas, through uh, education, through culture, um, through various uh, areas of influence where God has kept us here. And uh, uh, I live in Delhi, and my wife, we live in Delhi. But today I am joining from um, a place called Dehradun, which is the capital of Uttarakhand. Um, last three days, we have... Um, uh, a reunion of all the officers of 1980 batch, all the uh, foreign service officers that were made. Um, so we, we, we just had a three days meeting. And so I'm, I'm very glad to meet all of you today on behalf of the Indian Christian Day. This is a God's movement uh, where Christians, irrespective of the denominations, whether they are Catholics or Protestants or Pentecostal, we all get together to celebrate Jesus Christ in our life how he has influenced us, and how we can use our values. That's the reason we have gathered here. And uh, we will begin the meeting with um, a word of prayer. Shall we request all of you to pray together? Father, we God, we want to thank you for this beauty. Look at you for God's guidance in our life as to what we need to do in terms of our own personal life, what we need to do in terms of our family, what we need to do in terms of our church and the nation as a whole, and especially through this um, Indian Christian Day movement. Father, we pray that you will unite us together. We will honor you because you are our God and we are your children. The next one hour as we spend together, we pray that the Spirit of God may be upon us and guide us and lead us in every way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, this um, Indian Christian Day, most of you are aware um, that as God's called children across India and around the world, people in, in Indian diaspora, how we can celebrate God's faithfulness in our life. How we can celebrate God's wonderful thing that he has done in our lives. In the, in the lives of, you know, in, in Christianity, through Christianity, to the Christian influence in various areas. This year, we especially look at the influence of Christianity on education. How various educational institutions, which were developed by Christians across the, the nation have really impacted the lives of people. We are all aware that um, there are many Christian institutions, things like uh, Oxford, Cambridge, they all started as excellent Christian institutions. And in India, yes, you, you find the Christian schools and colleges making a huge impact, touching the lives of people. And so this year, in the Indian Christian Day, our focus will be on um, education. As through education, how we have touched the, how Christianity has touched the lives of many people. Um, today we'll have three speakers. I'll introduce them to you in course of time. Uh, but what I want to tell you at the beginning is that education is one of the great things that can really influence, that can really touch people. 
the, the, the education that we give can transform India, especially when there, is a, there are a lot of areas where there is a poverty, where people are not able to come out of their poverty. As God's called children, can we give them education so that through education, these people will be able to come out and then live for Jesus Christ. That's an area that we'll be focusing upon. Once again, we would like to welcome you together in the next maybe uh, 50 minutes. We will focus on this very, very specific area. So we, we welcome you once again. And now we will have a special song. And after that, we will continue with, our, with the three speakers. दिशा में पाऊं तुमको हर एक दिशा में छा जाओ कौन दिशा में पाऊं तुमको हर एक दिशा में छा जाओ धरती से अंबर तुम ही तुम धरती से अंबर तुम ही तुम रंग रंग में लहराओ कौन दिशा में पाऊं तुमको हर एक दिशा में छा जाओ चंद्र की रश्मि ईश की ज्योति पुलकित मेरी आत्मा होती चंद्र की रश्मि ईश की ज्योति पुलकित मेरी आत्मा होती तुम ही हो प्रभु पुष्प सुगंधम जिसकी महिमा हर पल होती अपनी दया से मुझको सजाओ अपनी दया से मुझको सजाओ मन का टूटा तार मिलाओ मुझ में समा के मुझको उठाओ द्वार खुला है प्रभु भर आओ कौन पड़ा है तुमसे जगत में तुम ही तुम ही तुम ही तो मेरे सरिता पर्वत वृक्ष में हो तुम तुम ही तुम ही तुम ही तो मेरे कौन दिशा में पाओ तुमको हर एक दिशा में छा जाओ What a lovely song. I'm sure you enjoyed the song. This is um, um, an, a, a song of tradition and a song which really honors God in a wonderful way. Uh, we thank God for such lovely songs. And uh, Christianity has uh, so many songs which will revive us, which will encourage us. And uh, I, I'm glad 
that today we were listening to this wonderful things, right? Um, in the Indian Christian day, we are all looking for the special day, um, which is basically July 3rd, which is Monday. I'll talk about it later. For the time being, we'll go ahead with the three speakers. The first one is Father Dr. Leonard Fernando. Leonard, Leonard Fernando is a very, very distinguished teacher, professor, vice chairman, and director of St. Joseph's College, Trichirapalli. Most of you know uh, about Trichirapalli, which is in Tamil Nadu, and uh, St. Joseph's College is well known, which has produced excellent people. And um, he was the principal of uh, Vidya Jodi College of Theology in Delhi earlier. And he has served as a professor in many colleges in India as well as in Europe. He did his master's at Gregorian University in Rome and of Vidya, Vidya Jyoti Journal of Theological Reflection. He was also general editor of History of Christianity in India. Wonderful thing that um, what is the Christian in India? And uh, no better person than Dr. Um, Leonard Fernando, who could explain to us. He is the author of many books, and uh, he is author of many articles, a very, very known scholar in India. I'm glad that God has raised him and God has kept him as a person of influence, not only in the college where he is working, but in the society as well, in the church, in the society, in the place where he lives. He was... Uh, a member of the Historical Commission of the Diocesan Inquiry for the Beautification Process of Mother Teresa of Calcutta. What a great honor. Mother Teresa, well-known personality, uh, not only in India, but across the world. A person who dedicated her life for the people of India. I've been to that place many times in Kolkata. And um, in Department of Post, we have brought out um, uh, rather three stamps on her and I had the privilege of bringing out one of the best stamps on Mother Teresa and he was also served as the president of the His Church History Association of India. Um, my dear brothers and sisters, it's an um, honor that uh, Dr. Leonard Fernando is with us and uh, he will speak to us on the history and impact of Jesuit Education Institution, the Development of India. And we welcome you, Dr. Leonard Fernando. It's a great honor to have you. Over to you. For the next 12 minutes, he will speak to us. Go ahead, sir. Thank you for your words of welcome and introduction, Dr. John Samuel. It's nice to be here once again for our day, Indian Christian Day, as we look forward to the July function again. And... Uh, it's a great opportunity given to me today to speak on the history of history and impact of Jesuit education institutions in the development of India. Actually, it's a history of around 475 years and plus, but I will not be able to spend all the details of it because of time limit. I'll be explaining the major important turning points of the history of Jesuit education institution in India and also how it has impacted Indian men and women. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, because we are gathering together across the world. Education is a mission which the Jesuits took up in the beginning and which is continued by the Jesuits till today. And that is what we call education is synonymous with Jesuit mission. Interestingly, some of you may be already aware of it, the origin of the society itself in 1535 was in an academic milieu at the University of Paris. Our founding fathers, 10 of them, were students of, at the University of Paris, having obtained the master's degree. And during the study time, they came together, prayed together, and decided to walk on a path of the Society of Jesus. Not only that, schools soon became a part of Jesus' self-definition. The beginning, the Jesus were involved in public preaching in the hospital, working in the hospitals, but soon because the demand for education came from different parts of the world, the Jesuit self-definition became school itself. That is why 
the Jesus are called the Jesus Catholic religious order, which took up education history of apostolate in a big way. It became a teaching order. Now there are many other congregations, orders of the society of the Cong of Catholic society where they are taken up the teaching order like Salations and others. We are aware when I speak about the 16th century, 1540s, we are aware of the situation in India, in Tamil Nadu, and elsewhere too, where education was restricted only to a few people based on the dominant caste system, and education was not allowed for other people. But the Jesuits, along the poem after Francis even Francis Weber himself, they started a new uh, development of schools in the villages wherever they had converted people to Christianity and thus opened the portals of education for all the people. So from dominant caste group restriction became open to everybody, people who had never gone to school earlier began to learn the schools now. And what was the, what was the use of learning at that? Not only they were able to read, read and write, the rudiments of reading and writing, and arithmetic, and they were also taught Portuguese language at that time. They were taught in the village schools, besides teaching religious prayers, catechism, and narrating gospel stories. Because this education of reading, writing, arithmetic, and Portuguese provided opportunities for the Christians, for the schools, for functional employment, thereby empowering a person for more economic opportunities, growth, and development. So not only reading and writing alphabets, but also employment opportunities. After establishing the fundamentals of learning in primary schools, the Jesuit missionaries established schools of higher learning in some places. We see that for Henry Hendricus, the successor of St. Francis Xavier in uh, Tamil Nadu, he selected a few Tamils who were well-versed in the languages and sent them for higher education in Kerala. Moreover, this I would like to underline, in, since 1543, a few Jesuits <clears throat> had been teaching reading, writing, grammar, and catechism for about 600 male students in St. Paul's College, Goa. Very often they say the Jesus founding of the first school is in Messina in Italy, but the history has to be corrected to say the first starting of the educational mission of Jesus in the whole world is in India in the 1543. This school for St. Paul's College was originally founded in 1541 by the Portuguese and handed over to the Jesuits in 1543 to run St. Paul's College. And this college was the first educational institution in India. <clears throat> in this, yes, it run higher education institutions. What was the method they follow? More or less they follow it today also. Formal classes were held till noon. The afternoon hours were spent on repetitions of morning lessons and in social work. Social work was insisted upon. Frequent repetitions, now known as tutorials, were an integral part of Jesuit education. Social work was an important dimension of both teaching and learning. Teachers and students engaged themselves in different forms of social activities, like visiting the sick in the hospitals and the prisoners in jails, distributing food, clothes, and medicine to the poor and the needy. This has continued today also in the different colleges by the so-called outreach programs under different names, Shepherd, Stan, and where they also respond to the social needs of society, where the students are made to grow in the social awareness. Besides, there are also today uh, two institutions. One is the ICAF, All India Catholic University Federation, another one, LASAC, where for the students, school students, which focus on developing leadership qualities and social awareness among the college and the school students. Moreover, co-curricular activities like acting in dramas, writing and recital of poems were promoted. The aim was to give holistic formation to students. This is continued even today. The society in the recent past has adopted new governance structures in education to share responsibilities with the lay collaborators. The society just in the beginning when they had uh, mission for the people, the so-called brotherhood or confraternity, they had lay collaborators and tried to inspire, instill in them the, the spirituality of the Society of Jesus. They tried to give them the Ignatian pedagogy with lay people. This is continued even today with our own uh, in the colleges too, preparing them for their mission. 
This is the outreach program I spoke, spoke to you about. Jesuit education took a step forward through its outreach program to go beyond the four walls of the classroom and embrace the poor and the marginalized. It is compulsory for the students, UG students, to be involved in this outreach program. Actually, this was started in St. Joseph's College Trichy by one Father E. Sudhasan, specialist on English on, uh, on uh, Gandhi. And this has been adopted by the university for all the colleges. You see the students surrounding the collector of uh, Trichinopoly, where he's watering the plant, uh, tree planted in, the, in our campus, the village campus, for welfare of the people. New initiatives. The Jesus run now several hostels for school and college students. You see two huge buildings for the hostels in Trichinopoly and other areas. In some provinces, in addition to the traditional school and institute of higher education, schools of other types appeared in great number. Primary schools, technical schools, apostolic boarding, seminaries, etc., etc. Now we come to the 19th century, our recent tradition. You know, in the 1773, the Society of Jesus was suppressed all over the world, and in 1814, it was restarted, and afterwards the Jesuits came again. And one of the mission they started was education. And one of the groups of people who suffered because of the suppression of the Society of Jesus was the students who were studying there. So from the 19th century, a short history from Jesus from the English Jesuit province opened St. Francis Xavier College at Calcutta in 1834. You see, the previous groups came by our Lisbon under the patronage of the Portuguese king. But now from the 19th century, they come from different uh, states, different countries of Europe and Asia and start their mission in different parts of India. In 1859, the same school, same college, St. Francis Xavier College was restarted by the Belgians in, in St. Uh, Park Street, which is continued even today. St. Joseph's College, Trichinopoly, where I'm stationed, was the second Jesuit institution to be started by the French Jesuits in 1844 at Nagapatinam. It was transferred to Trichinopoly in 1883, where it stands till date to celebrate the 175th year of its founding some four years ago. The French Jesuits also established St. Mary's High School in 1850 in Dindigat, Tamil Nadu, to educate the poor and ignorant people. Later, it was developed as higher secondary school. In 1869, St. Xavier's College was founded in Mumbai at a place called North Point outside Darjeeling. In, a school was established in 1888. There were many more schools founded in different parts of India, schools and colleges in Ranchi, Orissa, uh, Madhya Pradesh, all over India. I will mention uh, statistics of how many, how many Colleges were there, but this continued to the 19th century. Different parts, people from different or different countries came and established a school here. Following the footsteps of the Jesuit educators of the 16th and 18th centuries, the European and American Jesuits established a mission in India, though transplanted the European model of education to the Indian soil, simultaneously tried to assimilate the elements of the local culture and languages. They enculturated Jesuit education. They involved themselves in tribal and Dalit educational programs, social research, and action and social communication. <clears throat> Though they had to pay, pay a lot of price for that, but we continue still with this social action and the communication. With the growth of more colleges and specialization, Jesus colleges have expanded their academic programs and introduced postgraduate and doctoral courses. Autonomous colleges. The government of India introduced the concept of autonomous colleges in the 1970s to bring about qualitative innovations in the higher education. Some Jesuit colleges were granted this situation on the basis of their performance and contribution. Today, there are around 15 Jesuit autonomous colleges in the country. The next stage in the university setup was starting of the universities. So far, uh, in India, the Jesuits have started Three universities, one in Varisa, another in Calcutta, another in Bangalore. Others are thinking in the process of making much more, more universities in the future. Men and women for others. Uh, Jesuit education has formed students who have grown up to become men and women for others. Uh, I would like to quote what former president of India, APJ Abdul Kalam, 
our illustrious alumnus of St. Joseph's College who did his physics, UG studies in physics here. He came from village surrounding, got introduced into the physics, and from that went on to great achievements. He says, being a Jesuit alumnus myself, I'm aware of the great contribution of Jesuit education, not only in India, but around the world. And Dr. Manmohan Singh, the former prime minister, who did not study in our college, but his uh, family members studied in us. And he said, the Jesuit missionaries who came to this country chose the path of education to reach out to the hearts and minds of the Indian people. Institutions like St. Xavier's provide progressive all-round education to the rich and poor, privileged and underprivileged, and to the children of all faiths and all religions. The Jesuit fathers have self-consciously or otherwise become part of the confluence of culture and learning. We owe these fathers a deep, deep debt of gratitude, and I salute them for the immense contribution to the intellectual enrichment of the people of our country and to the nation at large. Ignatian pedagogy is uh, 5.13 main elements of experience, reflection, and action, along with the pre learning element of context and post learning element of evaluation. And we seek to instill, instill in our students and make them as men and women of conscience, competence, compassion, and commitment. Now, the ch uh, challenge to us today is the challenge posed by the youth manipulated by drugs. And we have started centers and having regular sessions for the students in the college and school uh, to remove them from this uh, uh, from this uh, addiction to drugs, alcohol, internet, and pornography. So to conclude, I would like to put across to you the education institution in India: three universities, 38 arts and science colleges, eight colleges of education, seven business schools, three engineering colleges, one law college, three faculties or colleges of theology and philosophy. 110 higher secondary schools and students who study in a higher education centers are 1,11,000 and students in higher secondary schools over 1,15,000. There are many primary schools run by us. For lack of time, I'll end with that. Thank you for this opportunity given to us, given to me. Thank you. I'm sorry. Oh, what a joy to hear. Um, the wonderful thing that you talked about in by the Jesuit education. Uh, starting from St. Francis Xavier, where you mentioned about um, St. Paul's College in Goa. And uh, later on, many of the colleges like St. Xavier's College, Loyola College, St. Joseph's College itself. Um, most of these places have been. And then you talked about North Point. In fact, the, the impact that North Point has been making in Darjeeling is enormous. Uh, you can see the result in uh, Kalimpong and, North, uh, and uh, Darjeeling even now. Uh, as uh, Dr. Leonard was mentioning, basically these Christian institutions, um, different ones across India, started by Jesuits, basically they help people to embrace the poor and the marginalized. That's a very, very important thing because it's not only the education provided to the elite, but can we uplift everyone irrespective of gender and many other things, the Dalit upliftment and many other things that have been done um, thank you so much for sharing this information. Uh, Jesuits have made a tremendous impact. In fact, I studied uh, in St. Xavier's College. Um, and uh, so I know the impact the uh, Jesuits have been making, continuously making in these areas. Thank you so much, Dr. Leonard. We'll move on to the next one. Thank you, Dr. Leonard. Thank you so much. All right. Um, now, as he talked about uh, the education in the area of... Uh, um, Dalit upliftment as well as uh, women empowerment. The next speaker is Mrs. Cynthia Stephen, a well-known scholar, a well-known researcher, a well-known journalist from Bangalore. And uh, I'm aware that she has made a tremendous impact. Those of you who have been to Bangalore, uh, you know the impact that she has been making in different areas. She has uh, written articles for newspapers, magazines, and journals. And she has also written chapters in many books. She has a great passion for um, women empowerment, and especially she provides leadership in several initiatives in justice. And um, especially for women empowerment groups, she has been much concerned about it. Um, she is uh, yeah, president of Training Editorial and Development Series Trust. She calls it as Ted's Trust, T-E-D-S Trust, 
and she is based in Bangalore. A person who is um, always smiles, you can look at her. And she has a greater passion to see that women are uplifted in our nation. And uh, now uh, I'll invite her to talk about the contribution of women missionaries. I mean, uh, she'll talk about the indigenous missionaries and uh, widening access education role of missions and English language education. That's the one that she'll be, Cynthia Stephen will be talking to you. Over to you, Cynthia. Please go ahead. This is Thank your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I've been given uh, 12 minutes. And uh, so I will quickly uh, go straight to the topic. Um, I, here I've uh, decided to talk about the indigenous visionaries because uh, everyone knows that the missionary uh, impact upon education has been very powerful, but along with the uh, missionaries who came from abroad, uh, I think there are a lot, there are uh, a few very important Indian uh, uh, missionaries who worked in this area. And uh, of course, the first one who comes to mind uh, is Jyotira Phule and his wife Savitri Bai Phule. Now, Jyotira was not just uh, in education. He was a, um, a visionary in many other areas, and I would uh, like to talk a little bit about uh, him and his wife, uh, uh, Savitri, Savitri Bai. The Fule couple uh, were based in uh, Pune, and uh, uh, he belonged to a community of market gardeners. His father traded in flowers, and so he was, um, uh, he, he, uh, he was sent to school. Uh, and was a very bright student, uh, but uh, he was uh, his father being in business because of the prevailing um, attitude uh, of the uh, business um, uh, community in those days. The sons used to continue with the father's business, and also there were uh, Brahmins who used to uh, be a sort of opinion leaders in the community. It was their business to see that people uh, within stayed within their caste roles. So uh, he, uh, one uh, contact of Fule's father uh, insisted that it was wrong on his father's part to, to uh, make this boy, uh, his son, study, um, uh, go to school. He says, if you send him to school and he starts working, who will help you in your business? So under that kind of pressure, uh, the boy was taken out of school. But uh, he, because he was a very bright student, his, uh, his school teachers, one was a Muslim and one was a, a Christian, uh, they, they spoke to the father and said, no, no, such a bright boy needs to study. And uh, there's another uh, individual in this story, and that is his aunt, Saguna Bai. His mother, that is Fule, uh, uh, Jyotira Fule's mother, passed away at childbirth. So he was born uh, practically with no mother. And his aunt was a single lady, his uh, father's sister, she was the one who uh, hand read the child. And later on, she, she continued to be a single lady and she started uh, working in the home of a uh, missionary, Mr. John in uh, Pune. And he, Mr. John ran a school in his home for boys. And of course, they were taught uh, English, maths and so on. And uh, the, the aunt, Saguna Bai, spoke to her employer and requested him to please ensure that the, her nephew uh, gets into the school also. So when the uh, father decided to put him back in school, he was put in this English uh, medium school. And it was here that Fule read a very, very momentous decision because that is where he learned English. And this is where Fule got access to the book, The Rights of Man, which is actually the first book on human rights ever written. The enlightenment in Europe was very, was very strong and this was the first book on human rights that was written. And uh, it was written by Thomas Paine. And so uh, Fule happened to get uh, this book just a few uh, years shortly after it was published. So very early on, there was this impact of enlightenment thought in India because this young man, he must have been in his teens, read the book and started critically analyzing uh, uh, what he was uh, uh, facing in the society or what society and his people 
were uh, experiencing. And that is where he started. He was the first one to critically write a book known as Gulam Giri, which means slavery in his own language. And he did not use the literary uh, version of his language. He used the spoken version for his uh, 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 book. And he wrote about the Dashavatara, which is the a critical understanding of what the uh, Brahminical uh, teachings were on the 10 avatars of Vishnu. And uh, so it, it takes the form of a dialogue between uh, a very innocent uh, country bumpkin and the protagonist who's the voice of the author. And so there are lots of questions about how come uh, there was a fish and how come uh, uh, there was a uh, boar and you know how, how can a human so, the, so in this manner, it was the first um, critical view from the backward class perspective or a non-Brahmin perspective of the Brahminical scriptures. It was a very, very important uh, publication. It became a hit and probably it was the first one on. He went on to write a lot more books. He also got convinced as the result of his thought and work uh, that it is impossible for the society or the community to progress if women did not have education. So he decided to start at home. He was married as a, uh, as a very young person, maybe he must have been 13 or so. And his wife was about nine years old when they got married. And so the, he started first teaching his wife to read and write. And later on, he was, she and another friend uh, Fatima Sheikh uh, uh, were uh, both sent to a teacher's training college uh, in a nearby town uh, run by a missionary lady uh, who ran schools for, uh, 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 for converts or for uh, missionary children uh, or for the uh, children of the elites. And uh, so they underwent teacher's training and then they came back and the, uh, uh, Jyotira Fule and Savitribai Fule and uh, here, uh, Fatima Sheikh and her um, um, brother, Usman Sheikh, were the first people to have a vision to start schools for girls in India, which were indigenously run and not missionary schools. The reason for starting the schools was that, as I said, missionary schools were confined to uh, certain sections of society and not open to all. The, another important part of this, this process was that uh, this was also a time when uh, the um, education charter had been passed earlier in 1813, I believe it was. And so there was a, uh, uh, there was some kind of support. Earlier, there was no support for, from the um, uh, East India Company to uh, education. But at the time when the foolish were active, the crown had, I think, uh, come into the picture and there was some uh, interest in investing in English education. Everybody knows about the famous note by my colleague. And this is also the time when the, a commission was set up uh, because people were starting to ask for access to education. There was a, um, uh, there was a set of people uh, in uh, Pune who ran schools, but they felt that uh, schools for general education was not necessary for children of the lower caste, so-called lower castes. And so there was this uh, a people, famous people like Tilak and Gokhale uh, and Ranade who were supposed to be reformers, but who advocated um, uh, that, that um, education, general education, English, language, maths, etc., science, uh, history, such subjects need not be taught to the children of the working cl uh, classes. The children of uh, those uh, sections could be taught uh, there also, if it's a carpenter, then they can be taught their crafts and, uh, uh, you know, uh, according to their uh, traditional uh, form of education, they can have their, um, uh, they can have their uh, access to education. But it was uh, Jyotira Fule and his wife and friends who really lobbied very strongly for public funding to the general population. This was a very powerful policy decision uh, that they uh, pressurized the government. Uh, the, the government sent, uh, set up the Hunter Commission. 
And uh, so a presentation was made by uh, Jyoti Rao and Savitri Bhai Phule. And also, it was also a time when um, Pandita Ramabai was active. Pandita Ramabai is one, the, one of the best kept secrets uh, of Indian uh, uh, you know, history in India, Christian history in India, for a number of reasons. She was a, a pioneering uh, woman leader with uh, huge visions for the country for empowerment of women. Uh, she did uh, outstanding work and her institution building was su such that even to this day, the institution that she set up, the Pandita Mabai Mukti Mission, still continues to be active in Kedgaon and Pune. And uh, so she, she wrote a number of books. She was a Sanskrit scholar, and that is why she got the um, titles uh, Pandita and Saraswati. Her name was Ramabai, and uh, she was given um, the title Pandita Ramabai Saraswati by scholars in uh, uh, Calcutta when she ended up there in the course of her uh, work and travel. Uh, subsequently, of course, she came to the Lord. She came, uh, underwent a conversion experience and decided to dedicate her energies to reform uh, the lives of uh, Brahmin women at first and later on uh, open her uh, services to all. And it is in that uh, context that the Mukti Mission was started because there was no, there were no institutional support for women who had, uh, who had been widowed, for instance, and uh, particularly, and for Brahmin widows, it was difficult because they also had uh, to uh, follow some uh, caste-related uh, dietary and um, other practices. So she set, set up um, uh, Sharada Sadhan for them. Later on, she shifted to Kedgao and uh, the Mukti Mission was started. And one of the big things was that she was the one who opened up uh, multiple vocational trainings for women. Her girls were able to do all the work relating to productivity in the uh, ashram that she started. So they were the ones doing the um, uh, printing, the publication, the translation, uh, all the cooking, growing of food. Uh, so they uh, were an all-woman uh, ashram and uh, did all the work uh, relating to the ashram administration and, and uh, education and everything. So this was uh, this institution that she built still stands as a testimony to her skills and to the faith and her her enduring uh, talent. And uh, so these are the uh, three people I would like to highlight as the um, examples for us uh, as indigenous visionaries. Uh, of course, needless to say, the work of the um, uh, Tamil. Uh, I'm sorry, the work of the uh, missionaries from abroad uh, were very great. We just heard a very detailed presentation from uh, Father Leonard uh, about, uh, Fernando, about the uh, Jesuit missionary work. Uh, but uh, all over coastal South India, and also, of course, Calcutta, there were many, many uh, missionaries who contributed. And um, in, uh, uh, in 1620, the uh, uh, Tamil uh, I mean, the, the, the Danish mission was established in uh, what we call Tarangambadi. Uh, and uh, so in 1706, the German missionaries, Siegenbalg and Tuchok came and they learned Tamil. And uh, the, the, the first book in Tamil was published by them. That was the Bible, in their own version. In 1843, Machalipatnam, which is a very small town further, very much hundreds of kilometers up, the uh, Andhra coast had a college in those days, started by uh, Robert uh, Robert Turlington Noble. The Heba College was started, has its roots in the mid 19th century, but was formally started in the uh, early part of 20th century. But the very old college was in 1885 in Guntur in Andhra Pradesh. So these are some of the, and of course, we cannot forget the role of Ida Scudder and her role in not only uh, setting up medical services for women, but also for setting up uh, the tradition of nursing services uh, and also other allied uh, paramedical services, training for women in, uh, uh, in India in the first place. Also, uh, I should mention here that um, it was uh, Pandita Ramabai's insistence uh, and uh, ad advocacy uh, with uh, Queen Victoria uh, 
that nursing also became uh, uh, popularly taught for women, uh, you know, at the time and when Florence Nightingale was also advocating it, she also, um, uh, uh, Pandita Ramabai herself wrote to the Queen and uh, she had a hand in that, uh, you know, policy decision as well. So our indigenous visionaries are women and men who were uh, supportive uh, of uh, these um, uh, developmental plans for our society, for our people. Uh, we are proud to say that uh, they are the heritage uh, that has who taught them, uh, were the ones uh, who motivate them, motivated them uh, to become active in serving uh, and their faith, of course, in the Lord, were the ones who uh, were active in a service manner in the field of education. I think my time is almost gone, so I will stop now and I thank you for your, uh, uh, for your patient listening. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Cynthia Stephen, uh, for uh, your excellent presentation. The passion that was emanating from you when you talked about the education, especially for the girls uh, from uh, Jyotira Pule and later on Pandita Ramabai and many others, um, um, as to how Christianity has impacted um, the nation and especially through the education of uh, women, uh, downtrodden people. That's an amazing thing. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, now we'll move on to the next speaker. Um, on, again, on education, we will have uh, Reverend Jyoti Singh Pillai. Jyoti Singh Pillai, she's an ordained pray, priest of Diocese of Agra in South, Church, of South, uh, Church of North India. But more than that, currently she's working as the Executive Secretary for Women Concerned and children concerned in NCCI. Most of you know about the National Council for Churches in India, and uh, she is playing a key role. Uh, and she's also an advocate for the gender justice and uh, a just society. Unfortunately, I'm not able to see her so far. She has not joined. She has some challenges in terms of her uh, uh, joining today. Um, can I ask John to just um, um, uh, display the PPT which he has sent? Um, John, can I just put the can you just put the PPT? We'll just go through that. Brother. I'll, I'll, I'll ju just go through that, and I have also not seen this. Um, yeah, go ahead, uh, uh, John. Just just forward further. Um, Christian missionary's role in the field of uplifting the life of women. I mean, this is an important area where she talks about how um, the women, basically, how many things that hinder women from getting something as basic as education. And um, women in India at this time were segregated under the Parda system, being confined to women's quarters known as Zanana. And from there, the missionaries who have come, the women missionaries played a key role in bringing a change and hope in their lives. Um, how missionaries, we'll, we'll just go through that. And um, she talks about Isabella Tobon, which we all know how she is, um, is an American missionary to India, uh, how she played a very important role in the women's college in Lucknow. She opened the school for girls in Lucknow Bazaar, and uh, later on, yes, her work is uh, very, very important in UP and uh, as a uh, principal at Lalbag. Um, yes, the, how she has really helped in terms of the girls' education. We'll go further. She also talks about Helen Jerwood. Uh, how her ideals and ethos made a stretch to any length in her zeal, her mission. She went from house to house to kindle the light of education for the girl child. I think this is very, very important because uh, um, uh, where the girl children are at a disadvantage today, even today in different parts of India, how Helen came from all the way from United Kingdom 
and um, uh, she found that schools in Delhi, St. Thomas School is one of the very famous school. I know how the St. Thomas School has been impacting many people, how many people have been touched because of St. Thomas School. With ideals and undying mission, she went from house to house. Again, primary thing is how we can give education to the girl children. She opened a school by name Parda in Jama Masjid area. In uh, this way, she started teaching eight Muslim girls. Amazing thing, a person who did a wonderful job for the women's education, Helen Sherwood. Well, today, women's health has become a significant platform for all to get onto. Doctors, pharmaceutical industries, social organization, many things are going on. Many slogans have come in, women's health have become nation's health. And I think this is an area the government has been giving a lot of importance on the women's health. And how Christianity has touched this particular area. Let's move further. Here we talk about Dr. Edith Philipson. And uh, she arrived in Mumbai. And uh, she was the first superintendent of Kama and Albless Hospital which was opened to the public in 1886. It was a hospital run by the women doctors for women and children of Bombay by Parsi philanthropist. She learned Hindi and uh, she had progressive ideas about women's social status. She lent support to campaign against child marriage. Even today, uh, India is facing a lot of challenges because of child marriage and Dr. Edith, even in eight those days when she came to India in 1845. She did an excellent job. These are all things which are eye-opener to us as to how um, these very, very important areas of women development is uh, a concern for everyone, a child of God, and how we need to be involved. Go ahead further. Priscilla Winter, again, uh, the Delhi Female Medical Mission, DFMM, Medical Mission in Delhi. And um, it was founded by Priscilla Winter, uh, amazing woman. And um, later on, it becomes a St. Stephen's Hospital for Women and Children, a hospital which is well known today, just like Ida Scudder um, down south in um, uh, Tamil Nadu, how she established a hospital uh, in Velour and here, Priscilla Winter establishes a hospital in Delhi. St. Stephen's College is well known. And um, uh, later on, yes, this has become an important area for uh, uh, spreading of the Christianity. And not only that, how God's concern is for um, helping people to come up when, when, when they are affected by many diseases, how as Christians we can really help. So the hospital in Delhi is a very, very important thing by Priscilla Winter. Yeah, go ahead. Dr. Anandibai Joshi, first Indian women doctor. I don't know how many of you know that. There's an amazing story about Dr. Anandibai Joshi. Um, she went to USA and she studied medicine. And um, she came back. And uh, she, with a medical degree, she wants to really bring a lot of changes. And um, Queen Victoria herself sent a personal congratulatory message to Anandibai and to the college which gave her this opportunity. She was appointed the physician in charge of the female ward of the Albert Edward Hospital. Most of you know about this Albert Edward Hospital in Kolhapur. Now, this is, I mean, this is an important area where Dr. Anandibai, the first Indian women doctor, she brought the changes. And uh, this is how the Christianity has really impacted in the health area. Right. Johnson Lissy, she raised funds for mission through, his, through her disability. And um, so though she did not visit India, but she raised fund for the mission in India in a larger level. Go ahead further. 
I think we have. Well, we, we may not want to acknowledge their contribution. Um, Sometimes we have not even heard the names. The whole idea of today's, this particular session is that there are a lot of people who have made tremendous contribution, both in the area of education and in health. And in Indian, Indian, Indian Christian Day, as we celebrate, I want you to learn about some of these people's contribution as to how they have contributed. Um, maybe their names are not much known, but with all those anonymity, Christianity has a, made a huge impact and we want to honor such people. Thank you so much. Thank you, John, for sharing that. We will share this with everyone. Friends, um, it's almost 8.59. I just want to say a few words about the Indian Christian Day. Um, it will be on Monday, July the 3rd. Keep that day. Save that day. It's on Monday. And um, between now and July 3rd, May 3rd and July 3rd, we have exactly two months. We want you to get involved because this is a primarily a God's movement. This is a people's movement. This is your movement. This is your event, I would say. And uh, since it's a God-inspired movement and a people-inspired movement, it's a national movement across India. And not only that, it's a global movement where all the uh, Indian diaspora will also be joining on that day. So from now on, for the next three months, we, for the next two months, we need to literally focus upon bringing everybody together on that particular day. You remember in the, uh, the book of the Esther, we find Esther telling the people, you know, I would call this as an Esther moment because um, India is going through many challenges for such a time as this. God has kept you and me in various places. Esther's strategy was very clear. She says, she tells Mordecai, go, gather all people, not just a few. Gather all people, fast and pray for me. We will also fast and pray. But then she says, I will go before the king. Then she makes the statement, beautiful statement, if I die, I die. On this Indian Christian day, I want you to bring a large number of people in different forums. You can organize in your city, in your state, in your church, wherever that you want to organize. Get it done because this is your moment. We'll talk a little bit more about this at the end of the program because it's now it's already nine o'clock. So um, after the program is over, still we will have a little more time to discuss about how we can celebrate it. And um, I want to thank each and every one of you who have joined here at uh, this program. And um, uh, we will continue to pray for this moment. And now we will close this meeting. I will request Dr. Leonard Fernando to close the meeting with a word of prayer. Thank you. God of history, we thank you for choosing each one of us and the people whom we have remembered to be messengers of your love, to be messengers who empower other people, who give education, health care, understanding, care and concern to our fellow men and women. You have made it possible for many of us, missionaries from abroad, missionaries from India, in our own time and times before, to carry on, to make people aware of Jesus, your loving message for us, and especially for the disprivileged people, the Dalits, the tribes, the poor ones from the villages, and the women, the girls, and others. Thank you for making us part of this venture. And thank you for making it possible for us to share the great works done by our four bears, our four fathers and four mothers, who are a real challenge for us today. And I'm sure inspired by their challenges, by their work, we will also meet the challenges that we are facing today in different parts of India 
facing the difficulties, the cruelties, the assailments on us. But we'll continue to work in your name and surely supported by your grace, by the gift of the Holy Spirit, we'll continue to spread your message of love and peace. Be with us and maybe as we continue for the next two months in preparation for the India Christian Day, the day of the Apostle, may we also become like the Apostle, even as martyrs, like the Apostle to share and preach your good news to the people so that many more people will be able to come to know Jesus, you and your Father who sent. We ask this in Jesus, your name. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Leonard, for that wonderful prayer. Once again, I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us this program. The official and formal program is over now.